and welcome to another episode of Real Ghost Stories Online. From realghoststoriesonline.com, I am your host, Tony Bruski. Welcome to the show. If you've shared the show with someone, if you've let a friend know about us, we thank you very much. That's what's helping to keep our show growing every single week, keep the audience alive and kicking and uh, keeping those ghost stories coming on in. So thank you so much. If you're new to the show, we ask that you do that, that you share the show with somebody. Email uh, me once you've done that, and I'll give you a bonus episode of the show as a thank you. Just share it on Twitter, Facebook, whatever your social media of choice is, or just tell someone about it. Better yet, if you do the, the social thing, you can send me a screenshot of where you shared the show, then I can reply back to you. And I give you that bonus episode. You email Tony, T-O-N-Y, at realghoststoriesonline.com, T-O-N-Y, at realghoststoriesonline.com, and you get that bonus episode absolutely free. It's a big thank you, and it's a completely unique episode made just as a thank you for the folks who have shared the show, and hundreds of you have already done that, so thank you so much. Uh, if you've not done so, please do so. It helps us make this show popular. Press that subscribe button as well, wherever you're listening to us. So you don't miss any future episodes of Real Ghost Stories Online. The phone number to call is 855-853-4802. If you have a real ghost story you'd like to share with us, we would love to hear it. we got some good ones today, some really good letters to get into on the show. We'll uh, kick things off this evening or whatever time of day you're listening to us. It's evening here with a, a ghost story caller from 855-853-4802. Oh, two. Hi, you're on the air at Real Ghost Stories Online. What you got? I was a couple years ago. I was sitting in my room, and it was really late at night. It was about midnight when I woke up, and I was thirsty. So I went out into the kitchen to get a drink, and I got my water, and then I turned around, and there was a shadow on the wall, and I didn't know what it was. And there was nothing or no one there to make the shadow. I'm assuming the shadow looked like a person. Yeah, it was like... It's a weird kind of shape, and it wasn't like anything in the room that could make that, and there's no way I could have made that shadow. Mm -hmm. And then I blinked, and it was gone. Like, it just disappeared. So it didn't move anywhere. It just dispelled itself. Yes. Shadow people. It's a very interesting topic. We've talked about it briefly on some other episodes. Is it a ghost, or is it something completely different? I've heard so many different thoughts on that topic where other dimensions, reflections of... And there's so many ways you could go. It really depends what your belief system is. But uh, nonetheless, we do get a lot of stories about shadow people and uh, and things of that nature on this show. With your real ghost stories, we'd love to hear them. 855-853-4802. 855-853-4802 is the phone number to call to share your real ghost story with us here at real ghost stories online.com let's read off our first letter of the show this comes to us from jeff jeff writes in today my family and i live in maryland but this event happened back in 1980 when i was about 19 years old living in my hometown of camden arkansas I was a freshman in the local college and still living at home with my mom, dad, and younger brother. Right before I graduated high school, we had moved into a one-story brick rental. It was an older home built in the 1920s, and it was in a stately old neighborhood. I remember the first day we walked into that house with the landlord. The living room had a beautiful wood floor, but there was carpet tracking around the edges. We asked about it, and the landlord said the carpet had been taken up recently because there had been an incident involving the previous tenant. An elderly woman had committed suicide and bled unto death on the carpet. The landlord went into an apology, saying he would have the tacking removed before we moved in. Now, I guess most people would have walked away at that point. I think that we would have too, but the house was actually very beautiful and we were tired of looking for a good house to rent and the price was reasonable. My brother and I both felt like we were being watched, both inside and outside this house. It had an amicable, or an ambience that made your skin crawl. And I felt strongest in the backyard, even in the middle of the day. 
Almost immediately, my dad began experiencing things. He told me on more than one occasion that he would be awakened at night to see an old lady standing on the opposite side of the bed, bent over, staring down at my mom, who was asleep. One night, he even claimed that he woke up to find the same old lady at the end of the bed holding his big toe. He told me these things, and I frankly took it all with a grain of salt because sometimes it was hard to know when he was serious or not, particularly with the big toe story. But one day he began complaining about a reoccurring rotten smell that would only last a few minutes in the middle of the night, usually around three or four o'clock, and would then disappear without a trace. At the time I thought he was the only one, at the time I thought I was the only one experiencing it, but I later found out that my mom knew about it too and it just made her sick. Here, I was a logical and reasonable young man in college who knew everything. I was skeptical and thought there was some logical explanation, like maybe a dead animal under the house. One day, I recall looking under the house with a flashlight. We didn't have a basement, just a sealed dirt crawl space. I couldn't find anything out of the ordinary, but one night, the odor returned, and this time, I was awake in the middle of the night and could smell it. It was a foul, rotting smell, and if you've ever smelled a dead animal on the side of the road in the hot sun, this is what it was like. And sure enough, before I could fall back asleep a few minutes later, there was absolutely no trace of it. Well, my scare came soon after on a weekend when I had to work late and close the pizza parlor where I was working to earn a few dollars during college. Weekends meant that we didn't lock the doors until midnight, and it also meant that I wouldn't be home until about 2 a.m. because of the work involved. After washing a mountain of dishes and sweeping and mopping the floors, it was about 2 or 2.30 before I finally pulled into our driveway. It was very cold and frosty outside, and the stars were bright. I remember it like it was yesterday. As exhausted as I was, I was wide awake when I walked into that house. My mind was as clear as a bell. I went through the front door into the living room and across to the interior hallway door. Now you have to understand that this house was built. There was a long hallway in the center of the house and when all the doors were closed like they were this night, the hallway was in pitch darkness. My bedroom was at one end. My little brother had a bedroom at the opposite end and my parents' bedroom was halfway between. In the winter, we always kept the doors closed to help keep the heat in. I walked across the living room without turning on the lights. I didn't really need them because it was particularly uh, partially illuminated by the street light out front. Then I opened the door to that hallway, stepped in, and I closed the door behind me. Now I was standing at the end of the hallway, and it was pitch black. My bedroom door was right behind there. I began to feel for the doorknob. Something. I still do not know what, made me turn around and look over my left shoulder. There, no more than two feet from my face, were two red glowing orbs, like eyes staring at me. I must have stared at them for about two or three seconds while the blood drained out of my head like someone had pulled a plug. I went into instant shock, my brain just shut down and I went into fight or flight mode. All the cool logic and ability to reason was gone in an instant. I became dizzy, my knees buckled, and I was about to faint. I clenched my eyes, shut, and began desperately scratching for my bedroom doorknob. It seemed like an eternity, but my hand found the knob and turned it and pushed it. As I pushed the door open, I began scratching for the light switch. I did not open my eyes until the light was turned on. And even though I was afraid to look behind me in that hallway, the light restored some of my courage and I turned back around and thankfully the red eyes were gone. Well, I was still very afraid and ended up turning on every light in the house. I thought my heart would pound right out of my chest. My dad woke up and asked me what was wrong. I told him and he said, I tried to tell you. The interesting thing was as I walked in the house that night and turned on the lights. The thought of seeing something spooky was the last thing from my mind because I had walked in like that hundreds of times and nothing had happened. That was the only time I saw those red eyes, but I will never forget it as long as I live. I've thought of that night thousands of times, trying to logically explain what happened, but I have never been able to. I 
couldn't tell you if that odor, those red eyes, or the apparition of the ghost of the old lady was one and the same or something entirely separate. We moved out after that. I was happy when we left. Thank you, Jeff, for writing in and sharing that very well-written story. I really, really do appreciate that. Ghost of an elderly suicide victim. Could that have been what it was? Or you also have to wonder, did the person who took their life take their life for a reason? Were they plagued by something in the house and couldn't take it anymore? Or are they now the person plaguing the house? It's kind of like what some of the stories behind the Amityville horror uh, claim. Where there were demons in the house, that's what caused Ronnie DeFeo to kill his family. And then those same demons plagued the Lutzes and lived there. Whereas some think maybe it was the ghosts of the DeFeos that then plagued the Lutzes as they lived in the house. Yeah, it's a very uh, interesting topic. I just watched a documentary on the Amityville Horror just, just this evening. Uh, one that was done by the Sundance, uh, or the Smithsonian Channel, rather. Um, and uh, it's kind of an in another inside look at Amityville. I don't know how many inside looks at Amityville we can have um, without talking to the kids at this point, because I think we've heard every single person's perspective on it that, uh, that has to talk that's alive, other than all of the kids, which we're still starting to hear those now, which is exciting, and we're hoping... That's that one of them will talk with us on this show. Uh, we did have a commitment at one point, <laughs> and then he kind of disappeared for a little while. But hopefully, in the uh, in the coming months, we can get him on the show. Um, and those are some interesting perspectives and the new things with that. If you are unaware uh, of of the the findings on the Amityville, the new chapter, if you will. Uh, are the, the kids, uh, two of the sons are coming out and saying, or stepsons rather, are coming out and saying that George uh, was into the occult and demonic activities and that he brought it all on himself, that he brought those spirits into the house. The previous murders may have had nothing to do with anything uh, with the haunting case, but it was George himself. Now, it's interesting to hear those stories. It's also interesting that these stories are now coming out after George has died. The kids were alive when George, and they were adults when George was alive. Why are they coming out now? Why were they not coming out previous? And there's a lot of logical reasons for that too. You know, there, there's, there's just, there's so many things with that case where you can really look at all of the sides and go, okay, that makes logical sense. And then walk away more confused than you were when you began looking into it because there, there's logic on almost every side where you go, okay, I get, I get this and I get that. So you exaggerate it for the book to make some money. Okay, I get that, but you're basing it on, on something, but you had to spice it up a bit. Okay, yeah, okay. Makes sense. And then you also get the, the idea of, oh, okay, they completely made the whole thing up and uh, it was all to make money. Uh, or with the kids, you didn't want to come out because you was already the story was plaguing you your whole life. You changed your name and you didn't want anything to do with it. And eventually, you just kind of gave up and said, "All right, I'm. <laughs> this is going to follow me everywhere. I might as well try and make a buck." Um, you know, there's there's a lot of interesting things, lots of interesting things with that whole story. One that that I have been interested in since I ever read that book as a child on summer vacation one year. Heard a lot of stories of kids or, or who are now adults that uh, did the exact same thing. Read the book and then have had that fascination with it for the rest of their lives, essentially. If you have a real ghost story, I'd love to hear it. 855-853-4802. 855-853-4802 is the phone number to call. Or you can write into us through our website at realghoststoriesonline.com. Just click on that Tell Us Your Ghost Story button, and we will try and get your story out on a future episode here at Real Ghost Stories Online. Let's now 
go to another caller and hear another ghost story. Hi, you're on the air. There's a housing addition that was built on top of the old Mount Carmel Academy, which was built in the 1890s. Okay. And when, when these houses were being built on this former property, there was one of the neighbors that we met and their little boy at the time was uh, 12 and he had a basement bedroom and he kept saying that the ladies walked through the basement and through the room and their dog would bark every night uh, when they first moved in they hadn't been there for maybe a week and he kept seeing these ladies uh, he just he described them as ladies walking through the room and through the basement well of course they just thought he was now he had no idea that there was a Catholic school at this on this location built in the 18 you know 90s. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, about a week later, their his, their dog died. Had and the doctor, the vet said that it was a heart attack. Well, about a month later, I had actually picked up some uh, pictures from the Cape and Mount Carmel school of what the area used to look like. And they had donated some pictures since we lived there. The little neighbor boy was looking through them one night with his parents, and he said, Mom, those are the ladies that looked like the ladies that went through the basement all the time. That's creepy. And the child can identify the spirits that he saw without really realizing they were spirits. That's where you got to walk away going, okay. This person has no motivation, no reason to make this stuff up. Where is it coming from? We have a real ghost story. We'd love to hear it. Phone number again, 855-853-4802. Be sure to press the subscribe button wherever you're listening to our show so you don't miss any future episodes. Just click subscribe, and then you got us. You get every new episode that we put out there. We do the show for free every week, and uh, it's kind of a labor of love, if you will. I have a ghost story for you. This one's written to us from someone named See No Evil in the U.K., they write, one night I was on my way home from work quite late because I worked in a bar in Barry Street, Edmonds, the ship. While driving home, I came across a buggy in the road. As any person's natural reaction, I stopped and went to see if there was a baby in the buggy. There was nothing there, so I returned to my car and began to drive off. Soon after, a car behind me started to flash his lights at me and followed me to my house, still flashing his lights. I was sure he was following me, so I parked up quickly and ran into my house. I woke my dad and told him someone had followed me home and they were still parked outside. He confronted the man in the car, however, it turned out that while I was checking the buggy, he had seen a man get in the back of my car. Me and my dad went to my car to see if anyone was in there. However, there was no sign of anybody apart from there being muddy footprints on my car mat. The man was adamant there would be someone in the car, but there was no explanation as to why there were muddy footprints. This really freaked me out and wondered if anyone had experienced the same as I did. Now, I have to question, is that a ghost story? Or is that the story of uh, someone trying to rob someone, of a thief or a murderer, and someone lucked out? You know, putting a, a, a baby buggy in the middle of the road as a decoy to get you to stop, and then when you stop, they sneak into your car and essentially hijack you. Well, ghost story or not a ghost story? I don't know. Creepy. I give you the chills nonetheless. Our next story comes to us from Trinity. Trinity writes, and I have a few ghost experiences and they may seem sketchy to you. It's up to you to believe. It's 100% the truth. It mainly started when I lived in Washington state. I believe ghosts and weird things, some super- supernatural ideas. Ghosts always interested me, but I freaked out every time I heard one. Let's begin first time I heard or saw one was on my phone. It was a flip phone. I was in seventh grade then, so of course I didn't have anything better. I was recording a music video from TV on my phone. I was alone in the room. Anyone else was downstairs, nap time. I finished the recording and I listened to it. About midway through, I heard a voice, a little girl's voice, 
She was whining and saying, Ow, my back hurts. She repeated that twice, and then I heard nothing. I was freaking out. Then one other time, I was sitting alone in my room again, and I was laying on my bed. Then all of a sudden, the cable box on top of the TV fell. No one was running or anything. It just fell silent. Next, I would dream of this girl, a short girl in a white gown. I thought nothing of it, but I woke up one night and looked over. I have a closet that is under a slanted roof ceiling. Standing by the closet door was the same girl. She looked and took a step forward, and I shut my eyes. When I opened them, she was gone. I couldn't fall back asleep. My last encounter in this house was late at night. It was around midnight. Everyone was sleeping. I had to use the bathroom. We had only one, which was at the end of the stairs. I started down the stairs, and it was dark and silent. Then to my ear, I put it nearly against the wall, and I heard a loud boo. My ear was facing the wall with nobody awake. I was terrified and ran back upstairs. This all happened in one house, my house in Washington. I was always wondering if I'd hear those voices again, but I moved back to California. The last time I saw something paranormal was while I was at a friend's house, also in seventh grade. We got bored and nobody was home. We thought we'd be geniuses and put on a bathing suit. We put on our bathing suits and then turned on the bathtub water. She got in and closed the curtains. I didn't want to get in yet. Went to the kitchen to get a drink and went back in. She was standing up with the curtains open. She told me, was that you a second ago? And I said, I don't know. I went to the, get a drink. And she said, but didn't you put your hand against the curtain? I shook my head. She was freaking out. So then I also got in. We sat in the hot tub water. Then we sat back for a bit, facing the curtain. We both saw it. A hand, a bit bigger than ours, pushing against the curtain. It was a dark silhouette. I rushed to open the curtain and nobody was there. This all happened. And it was while I was in Washington. I have one more story also, if you'd like to hear it. These happened while I was living in my current house. My mom brought me one of those globes where you twist the thing and it plays music. I was sitting in my room and all of a sudden it just started playing. It abruptly stopped. I said, Chris? They are my brother's dad who passed away. Then the music started playing once more. I said, stop. And it did. Coincidence, maybe. Maybe not. I think it was. Interesting stories. Do you believe? Or do you not believe them? That is completely up to you. My phone number is 855-853-4802, 855-853-4802, if you have a real ghost story to share with us on the show. Hi, you're on the air. My uncle and aunt had bought a mirror at a garage sale, and uh, one night, my uncle kept hearing somebody in the house. We kept getting up and checking on the kids and checking the house, and they were all fine, and he didn't find anything. Well, for about three times, he got up. When he comes back that third time, the spirit had taken over his wife, and she was sitting against the headboard of the bed and she was trying to tell him that it was the mirror to get rid of the mirror and it, the spirit would not let her do it and finally she was able to get it out well then it made her attack him and it went after him and she was this little under four under five foot little bitty person and he grabbed the mirror and threw it out the back door and when it shattered she collapsed and she was in bed for two weeks from the exhaustion of that thing taking her over she remembers it taking her over and having no control and all he could think is she's gonna kill me and then she's gonna kill my kids you, know, you hear a lot of stories about mirrors and haunted mirrors it makes you almost wonder what is going on with those images that a mirror captures or what is being captured inside the mirror yeah, I think about that a lot, especially at antique stores. I love getting antiques. My house is filled with them, all sorts of different interesting things. But one thing we do not buy at antique stores is mirrors. My wife has something about it, refuses to get them. I think some of them are kind of neat, but I hear so many stories like that. And now I'm almost on the same page where it's like, yeah, I think I can do without the mirror. Only fresh mirrors, only new mirrors that can capture my soul, not yours. <laughs> you know, it, or, or does age have anything to do with the mirrors and the thought of something coming through it? Is it 
just the object itself and what it can do. Does it have anything to do with age of the object or what it's seen? You know, that's that's an interesting one. 855-853-4802. 855-853-4802 with your real ghost story. Remember to press the subscribe button on the show so you don't miss any new episodes. And also share the show. When you share the show on Twitter, on Facebook, other folks find out about us. Helps us grow the show. Helps us get more great ghost stories to share with you every single week. And if you take a screenshot of where you shared it and email it to me, T-O-N-Y at realghoststoriesonline.com. I'll reply back to you personally with a link to a bonus episode of the show I've created just for you as a big thank you for uh, for sharing the love and letting other folks know about Real Ghost Stories Online. Hi, you're on the air. When I was a kid, I left walk and I wasn't, I never did that. I just remember I woke up and I was sitting in front of a mirror in our hallway mm -hmm. and just staring into the mirror. And I woke up like that. All these years, I've always thought, that's so strange, you know? And then I was watching TV and they had a story on ghosts and the other world. They said that back in the old days, people used to think that if you looked into a mirror and you saw your reflection, you could talk to the other side. Mm -hmm. I saw that story and I thought, oh my God, I was sleepwalking and I was trying to talk to the other side. <laughs> How old were you? I was like uh, pre-teen. I don't know. Oh, there's a lot of teen girls when I remember back to being that age that love to stare at themselves in the mirror. <laughs> Are you sure you weren't just like checking out your hair in the middle of the night or Pretty something? Pretty sure. <laughs> I was sleepwalking. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sleepwalking, that's another thing where it's, it's kind of spooky. Sure, I mean, there, there are clinical explanations for the act. But it almost makes you wonder sometimes, too, with what actions people take when they're sleepwalking. Where is that coming from? It's like there's the clinical explanations for the, the sleep uh, paralysis uh, and the midway point of dreaming where you open your eyes and you can see things that your mind's projecting out there. Okay, clinical explanation, I get it, but why... Are there so many of these same things being seen, especially the old woman thing? We've talked about that so many times in the show, and I get letters about it a lot. But it makes you wonder. It really does uh, make you wonder what is exactly going on. Is there something more than what medicine is able to tell us? Again, seeming to kind of end our show again on another note with more questions than answers, if you will. That seems to be uh, consistently where we're going on every episode of Real Ghost Stories Online. Guess it's what keeps us coming back, though, isn't it? Trying to find those answers, but still walking away with more than we had to begin with. If a ghost story, share it with us through our website, realghoststoriesonline.com, or call us and leave it for us, 855-853-4802. Call it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and you have about two minutes to leave your ghost story there for us. So go ahead and do that, 855-853-4802. Until next time, from realghoststoriesonline.com, Tony Bruschi, thank you for listening.